humbled by uh, the efforts here of the devotees to translate and publish my books in Polish. Um, Aesthetic Vedanta, I wrote about over 25 years ago. So, still good though. <laughs> <laughs> if I could only write it again, I could add a few things. But um, it's, uh, it, it was a well received book and, and it actually um, was nominated for some prize. What was that prize? Um, works, one scholar, um, Gravemeyer or something? Hmm? Gravemeyer or something? Yeah, Gravemeyer yeah. Award, yeah, for religious publishing, some scholar recommended it, Joseph Campbell, who passed away, who had some uh, acquaintance with Gaudi Vaishnavism. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very, um, I think, uh, thoughtful, contemporary uh, effort to bring people within the <coughs> understanding of uh, Krishna Bhakti and Rasa Tattva and then of course it's uh, a, a thoughtful, insightful commentary on the power of the Rasa Lila so certainly a core Gaudiya book so I'm very, very happy to see it in, in uh, Polish. And now you're working on Bhagavad Gita, right? Yes. It's, it's already translated. Already been translated by Maharaja. Thank you. And um, so when will it be published? I hope that it will be available on the next, the next retreat, the next festival. Oh, good. Yeah. That's my most popular book. I mean, it's the Gita, that's why. It's uh, always good for another side of the Gita. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I was happy uh, to share some passages and thoughts from my forthcoming book. And um, if the devotees have asked when it will be finished, and I can't answer that question. So, um, but I'm free. A fair amount of it, and um, and I, I I'm going record here thanking some of the devotees who encouraged me for a few years to write that this book um, because in writing it it's very very rewarding. So it's a, it's a book for devotees and a certain certain group of devotees, I think, as well. But it. Um, it's an important book for the, I believe, for our Sampradaya at the same time. So I feel honored to make uh, part of such a contribution. So books, books are important, and uh, again, very happy with the publishing efforts here. I think Poland is a nice community of devotees. It's a small community of devotees, and in a way. I mean, I come from the United States, such a big land mass, and devotees are all over the place. They're a little more concentrated here, and, uh, and uh, I think that uh, if, if, if the devotees in Poland can read my books, it would be refreshing for them because they're also a little insular in some ways in terms of their exposure. So try to share them with your, with your friends. With that, I'll ask for any questions tonight. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, Maharaj, I think you say a few times that uh, a good student is rare to find. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. how, how you define yeah. a good student? <laughs> well, you know, somebody else asked me that. You should already asked me that. She was the first person to ever asked me that question, although I made the point a number of times. And I had to admit I hadn't thought about it that much. I, I guess I know what a bad student is, but <laughs> a good student, then I started to you could, you know, mean, mean a number of things. And to be honest with you, it's, it's, it's relative to the student's progress and background. And so it could be one thing for one student, and it could be another thing for another student. Some come with more, more 
more so critical about the samskar um, from previous lives, in this life, and so it has to be a kind of a, a sliding scale <laughs> as to what makes a, a good, good student. But, uh, but one of the things, and I mentioned the Ishwari also, at least from my perspective, is uh, one that really fits, that really um, uh, uh, connects with me the way, at least for me, my student, in the way that I can, um, exemplify and teach about uh, Rodi Vaishnavism. And, um, and in that sense, uh, have made uh, or are making an informed kind of decision. And to be honest with you, most of my students are like that because they come to me from having had exposure to go to Vaishnavism in other places, and in other institutions, in other teachers, and so forth. And uh, sometimes coming out of that in a state of disrepair and damaged faith, so you all have something in common. Uh, but Sri Ramar asked me to do relief work try to help devotees who were becoming discouraged uh, due to circumstances and so forth. So the vast majority of my students anyway do come from that kind of uh, background and, um, and are making a choice that's more informed perhaps at, uh, at this time than they have in the past or that others then have been a more informed choice than uh, that others than others have made in other circumstances and so forth. And I think that's important. Uh, to be a good student, to, it's good to be a little thought out in, in one's choice and have some measure of Guru Vishta from, from, from the start, something like that. Um, but again, I'm just kind of rambling about it. So what does it mean to, make, to be a good student? And again, so many things come to my mind relative to uh, different stages of progress and, uh, and, uh, and so on. I mean, uh, to give an extreme example, one of my students became a Christian and I recently gave him some counsel and I, I felt he was a good student. <laughs> the way he responded and understood him. And, um, so it's really a sliding scale. That's to give an extreme uh, example. Um, after all, there's ours is not the only path to the broader idea of, of transcendence. But um, otherwise, um, there are a couple of things that do come to mind. Uh, one being that uh, well, uh, that we have our Krishna Bhakti. So, in the context of Krishna Bhakti, there's also Guru Bhakti. So, for example, when Rupa Goswami uh, begins to uh, speak about the angas, the limbs of the body of Bhakti, the first limb of Bhakti that he mentions is Guru Parashraya, taking shelter of the Guru, and getting siksha from the Guru, diksha from the Guru, serving him or her. Faithfully, enthusiastically, with confidence, and so on and so forth. Um, several angas about Guru Bhakti in the context of explaining Krishna Bhakti. So, Guru Bhakti is an important um, part of Krishna Bhakti. And so, in one sense, what that means is learning from the Guru about Krishna Bhakti and then. Um, faithfully uh, applying oneself in Krishna Bhakti um, with regard to um, commitments made. You know, the first uh, Anga of Sharanagati is what Angu Pratikul, accepting what's favorable for Bhakti and rejecting what's unfavorable. And the mood, if you will, behind 
than is a, a vrat, a vow, um, a promise, a commitment. Um, and so, the, in other words, the way in which that anga is embraced is through making commitment and, and living up to it. And of course, in the broader sense, when we do that, um, when we accept what's favorable for bhakti and reject what's unfavorable in the full sense of the term, we have uh, embraced a different standard of good and bad than that which is dictated by the mind and the senses. So the mind and the senses say this is good, or they say this is bad, and we live our lives accordingly, and we end up rising and falling on the ocean, <coughs> oceanic waves of material uh, duality, hmm? uh, trying to avoid this, the lows and trying to increase the highs, so to speak, which just ends up making one's self seasick. So by embracing a new, another standard of what's good and bad that transcends the reading of our mind and senses, in other words, if the mind and senses say this is bad, I don't like that, but it's good for bhakti, and I accept it. And if the mind and senses say that's good, I like that, but it's not good for bhakti, then I reject it. So you can understand that if you really embrace, make a commitment, and you embrace this anga very quickly, you're going to rise above, you base the dualities of material existence that arise in the mind, you're going to have a different reading of reality, and it's going to be quite uh, pleasant comparatively to the emotional ups and downs of material life. So Sharanagati is not, not a small thing. This is the beginning of Sharanagati in one sense, the, the first two angas. Um, so, so, at any rate, um, we, in, in, in serving our Guru, one of the things that we do is we embrace Krishna Bhakti as he or she has taught us and uh, in terms of what he or she has asked of us. So, for example, we ask them, the disciples to chant, or we may ask them to do other things. It's not a one-size-fits-all. How much you would chant may be different. And, and uh, we may ask the devotees to uh, engage uh, in different ways in what constitutes Krishna Bhakti. So, one aspect of being a good student then is to be committed to the Krishna Bhakti aspect of serving the Guru who asks you to do Krishna Bhakti and teaches you about Krishna Bhakti. Hmm? And um, um, another side then is that the Guru has um, his or her own perhaps service, maybe especially in our party bar mission, uh, um, you know, whether it be publishing books or opening a temple or whatever it may be, um, um, things that he or she is concerned about in the service of, of, of his or her guru. And the Guru Parampara has some, something to accomplish um, in this world for the Guru Parampara that will serve a wider range of devotees than those who are his or her uh, students formally. So uh, then, so to become acquainted with that, to become interested in that. Mm -hmm. And to think how I can participate in that is, is to have kind of grown, if you will, in terms of a relationship with the Guru. And, you know, it's obviously an easy way to get uh, one's attention. Indeed, it's said that that aspect of being a student and serving the Guru uh, can be uh, so uh, endearing to the Guru, or so much uh, capturing the attention of the Guru, that it can compensate for, and even 
a, a, a lacking in one's ability to engage in Krishna bhakti, which the Guru is also teaching. It can even eclipse um, Krishna bhakti and make even make Krishna bhakti an anga, a limb of guru bhakti instead of the other way around. Because the devotee, guru is a devotee, uh, is, uh, is, is the most dear thing uh, to Krishna. So to catch this idea of Vaishnavism, in the same way, Kanishtadikari will serve the, the, the deity, and the Vaishnava or the Guru may be a secondary thing. But for the Guru or the Vaishnava to be the primary thing, and, and, and service to Krishna to be the secondary thing, that's a rather peculiar, but, but it is a progressive idea. Now, you know, it's not that everybody can live with the Guru and and tender to the things that he or she would, would have to do uh, that could be done by somebody else so that he or she could spend time on other things that others can't do. Hmm? It means little tiny things like grabbing the shoes, bringing the water, uh, you know, paying attention to those things. Those, those are the kind of things where you can do guru bhakti hmm, by living with the guru. But we can't all live with the guru in our uh, industrial society and so forth. Um, it seems the guru hasn't made a big enough house for us all <laughs> yet, but uh, Krishna hasn't. <laughs> but, uh, but we can be concerned about and interested in you know, what, uh, what, what Guru Maharaj is interested in and how to participate in that in some way and, and so forth. So this is kind of an inside track, if you will, to get in the attention of Baba Guru. And that's what we want. We really want the attention of the Guru who is someone of spiritual consequence um, in our lives. And we may be doing something small, but we have his attention. That's, that's the whole idea. Sadhana is about attracting Krishna's attention, right? So, uh, Krishna is always trying to serve his, his devotees. The devotees are never, never want to accept service from Krishna. So we can come in and serve the devotee, and then Krishna will be very pleased with us because if he wanted to do that. So we can, we can, we can do what, uh, what Krishna can't, but wants to do. In that way, and that's kind of, uh, uh, I think that that, um, that is um, uh, a kind of uh, spiritual uh, uh, wisdom and developed insight on the part of the disciple that uh, that, that um, as you can understand, naturally draws the attention of Guru to us and. and you know, you start to become one of his arms and legs and organs, and then he starts to think about you as he would on parts of his own body, and then he wants to, if he gets extra money, he wants to give it to you, <laughs> so that you have a better situation, so that you can, you can do the service and so forth. And suddenly, the guru disciple relationship starts looking like something other than what it, you know, formally is talked about in the scripture, and it's hard to understand uh, um, for others. And and the disciple might be the telling the guru, "Don't do this." And, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what you want. You, you, you kind of want to come to this type of intimacy, if, if you will, where the where the the, the rules are sus suspended and, uh, and the distance is, uh, is, is, is bridged, is, is, is gap, uh, the gap is, is, is bridged and, um, and it may look like one thing, but um, like there's a, there's a lack of respect or something. Uh, I'll give you an example. What, what, uh, once, uh, which what Sri Ramar said, uh, uh, thank you, create some distance. 
you say thank you, it create, it's a formality, you know, it creates some distance. And, um, you never, it's very, like, you don't often hear Indians say thank you. You might have noticed that. Thank you. And if you say, Daniela to them, they go, which means thank you. So they don't like hear it as hit. You know, in Western culture, at least in, 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 in the United States, it's like you're taught that as a child, say thank you, you know, show gratitude, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, Pujapat Chitamar's idea is that like, it creates some, it goes without saying. And if you have to say it, then you know, you're, you're bringing attention to something that's already understood and unnecessarily and was getting in the way. So, um, in my vision, that would be kind of an ideal uh, um, society of uh, guru and disciple, where in one sense it, it, it might look externally, even from an external uh, reading of the scripture, to be um, something different than what the scripture is talking about, what it really is talking about it. It, 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 or exemplifying it's, it in an essential sense and the full uh, um, it, it represents the full measure of Vishram uh, uh, Seva service with confidence and uh, uh, firm faith and so forth faith, confidence uh, Literal translation for Vishwam, Vishwam Guru Seva. So, um, and you know, Pujapat uh, Shudamarsh's mom was a, was a little bit like that for for me to experience compared to Prabhupada's, which was very formal. Prabhupada was at a, at a distance from most of the devotees. Um, the magnitude of his mission, the number of his disciples, of course, added to that, and it was a new thing. You know, in the West, to have a guru and uh, and uh, and so on. So, what what Bashida Marsh had a smaller scene and some intimate disciples that would uh, um, interact with him in ways that we wouldn't uh, as readily interacted with uh, with Prabhupada. But they had full love for Guru Maharaj. It, it wasn't absent. Their respect for him wasn't absent at all. It wasn't missing. It might have looked like it was missing from the, from the, to the naked eye, but it wasn't. It had morphed into it. It had turned into this uh, the, um, the application of that, the regard, the love, if you will, had really translated out fully into um, into a service that kind of. Uh, Was um, kind of a matter of the, of the heart, so to speak. Um, so um, that might be maybe my uh, my ideal of a guru and disciple kind of um, relationship. It's not exactly what I was talking about when I made the point. It's hard to find a good disciple. I think what I meant more at that time is that that. that it's easy to find disciples and be a little interested in the news interest and, and, and they, they don't, aren't very well informed about what it, what it is to begin with and that leads to their disinterest in time. Pujapat Sri Amar told me in the beginning he makes disciples out of anybody because you need some help. And they may come, they may stay, and they, may, they may go, but you need some help so go make some disciples. And, uh, and eventually then you know, you'll be able to collect some people who can really understand what you're, you're talking about. So um, I, I guess when I made the statement, it's hard to find a good disciple, I've said it before, um, I was in my mind thinking more of the, the example of not a, a good disciple who doesn't have interest in understanding the teaching, um, um, comes and goes, doesn't practice, um, uh, um, you can't have much of a relationship because he's not interested in the same thing. <laughs> um, 
that's another point too. Uh, some of the devotees asked me, and I do appreciate it, uh, that you know, Guru Maharaj and I serve you, and, and I want to, you know, have a relationship with you. That's get to know you better, or something like that, kind of a thing. And the answer to that, really, very practical. Well, you have to it takes time. It takes time. You got to hang out with me, and come to festivals, and come to Madhavan sometimes, and visit there. And, it just takes time and spends time. If you spend time, then you get to know how weird I am. <laughs> you know, understand my idiosyncrasies and humanness and so forth. And maybe be a game changer or a goal you know, to improve the, improve the relationship. Um, um, so, but the interest in that is, 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 is appreciated. And, uh, okay. Someone asked me that, that just today, and I can answer along these lines. So, um, to be interested in the subject, when I get questions from devotees that, that I can understand they're thinking about the teachings, they're reading the books, they're preoccupied with it, they have a question that, that, it, that it excites me, because that's where I live. So then I, then I, I, I might not have thought of that question, then I think, well, oh, that's a good question. And I get the inspiration to answer, and I could go on, you know, for, for an extended period and so forth. If someone asks me a question about something else, like human psychology, or, you know, how can I, you know, get a better job, or, you know, I get those kind of questions, because, you know, I try to give my best answer, but it's not what's really turning me on. And, and, it's not what I'm preoccupied with, so uh, it's not as, as stimulating. So when I find in the students interest in the things that we're teaching in the world that I'm, I'm living, then I think, well, that's a good, good student. He's thinking like that, he's thinking like that. Uh, that's what, that's bodhayam tas parasparam krishyam tichadam Krishna says in the Gita that they, that they the bodhis are mutually in, in enlightening one another. So it, it also refers to my estimation of the guru and the disciple because, like I said the other day, we're students forever in this. So if I'm the teacher and you're the student, but you ask me a question that causes me to think about the teaching in a way that I hadn't, then uh, something will come and I'll say something I've never said before and I will like listening to that. And, um, and this way we we'll move forward in terms of Tushan Dicha, Dicha, as the Gita says, in terms of Sambandha, Nuga, or Kamanuga, um, Bhakti. So, and the same holds true, uh, I suppose, on another level with different level of questions within Gaudi Vaishnavism. The level of interest, so you know, there may be more introductory texts, um, Although I kind of like it all, <laughs> you know, from the beginning teachings to the end teachings. Ooh, uh, the lower there are kind of like no lower teachings in one sense. Once I was asked by, by a guru in his con, a godbrother of mine, who was hearing from a, a sadhu, and he was hearing about topics that he was unfamiliar with, that were higher topics about lila and, um, and so forth, or asadichar. And apparently, the way he was hearing about it, and then he was repeating it to others, others were getting confused by what he was saying, because I guess they couldn't digest the higher topics, or he hadn't digested it enough, you know, how to repeat them in a way that would be appropriate and nourishing to um, uh, less advanced devotees. So, um, he asked me, how is it, that Sridhar Maharaj talked about higher topics in such a way that this, and this was happening apparently quite a bit in this particular circle that this fellow was coming from. So he asked me, how is it that when you heard from Sridhar Maharaj you talked about higher topics that you were, that the devotees, that there wasn't this kind of confusion that was created. And I said to myself, well, actually, uh, Sridhar Maharaj mostly talked about lower topics in the highest way. <laughs> that was, uh, 
and then very tastefully from there, you know, he would be taken to something here and, 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 and there would be a window to that and, and so forth. And I think that's a good point, actually, because uh, you can see, I think, get quite enthusiastic about some contemporary explanation of what it means to be consciousness rather than matter, even though that's like just the ABCs of Gaudi Rationalism. Rupa Goswami says, knowledge about the difference between the set, the Atma, and the body, and the Atma's kind of qualitative oneness with Brahman um, is not an anga of bhakti. You know how many times Prabhupada said, you're not the body. <laughs> so someone gets to see, he's not even teaching about bhakti, he's teaching about some lower thing. And we are talking about Anjali Bhava with all names. So. <laughs> well, we have to also understand that Rupa Goswami is saying this in a particular time and a particular environment where it was pretty much understood by everybody, at least theoretically, that you're not the body and there's reincarnation and so forth. And this is the preoccupation of the Advaita uh, school, and they had a strong hold on the religious uh, community. Um, and and so Gaudi Vaishnavism is, you know, it's, 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 it's a, uh, they were, Rupin is not, and so forth, they were establishing this for them. This new Sampradaya and, and so forth, and uh, and they were speaking about something beyond that. What was the potential of the Atma? Once you've figured that out, that you're not the body, does it stop there, or is there something more? And that's what Gaudiya Vaishnava is all about, right? That's the Chaitanya Charita Amrita, the Chaitanya means consciousness, so it's about the immortal, nectarine character of consciousness and transcendence, not just. Consciousness is different from matter. Nothing else can be said. Words stop there. The, the way to be done the perspective is you can't speak about it. So our perspective is you can't say enough about it. Words can't capture it. There's not enough that you can say. Anyway, so that's the teaching. It's true. Um, but, um, um, of course, as I say, Rupa Goswami is making that point in a particular environment. We're making an environment where people think they are the body, and even they're the leading philosophical currents of thought and, um, in, in the world today are uh, that there's nothing but physical forces in the world, and there's no mind, what to speak of an atma or a soul or an individual person. It's only, it's, so it's like, if you want to speak to them, you kind of got to get in there on that level and so forth. And, you know, I could get excited about it too. Um, and um, I speak about it to some extent. You know, you've heard it from me, so you know, you know that I, I do that. Of course, that said also, it's true that in the context of Sambandagyan, which means the knowledge of, of bhakti, which who is Bhagavan, who is the Jiva, who is matter. You do have to explain the relationship between matter and the Jiva, the Jiva and Bhagavan. So the fact that the Jiva is not the body, of course, it does come out in the context of some of the Gyan. Um, but unto itself, anyway, it's not an Anka, the Bhakti. But that's it, it's, a, it's kind of a lower topic in, 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 in any event, even within the context of some of the Gyan, or higher aspects of some of the Gyan, obviously. But, um, yeah, but really, it's true. Um, all of these uh, topics are very uh, uh, exciting. Once uh, uh, the Balabatir Dhamara, who passed away, in, I guess within the last year, um, he, a book of his talks on the Prahlad, Chari, the character of Prahlad, the Prahlad, the Shringalila, was published. and. Um, on the back of the book, on the back cover, it was, I think it was in the back cover, it was written, uh, this is a story of Bhagavan and so on and so forth. Those who say that they already read this, this story of Prahlad and Shri Nuba, there's so many lessons there, but, um, you know, it's not Rasalim either. And so he said, those who said, I've already read this, he said, 
they hadn't read it. Because it, 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 you have to remember, who was it that taught Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Shiva Bhagavatam? Who knows? Who was his Bhagavatam teacher? Karada Pandit. Pandit Ji Karada. Speaker of Bhagavatam. And in Chaitanya Bhagavatam, it's related that repeatedly, repeatedly, that uh, the stories of Dhruva, Dhruva Maharaj, and Prahlada Sri, which covers ten chapters of the Bhagavatam, were explained and recited by Karada Pandit and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. You might think, well, he obviously you only talked about Rasa Lila there. Mm -hmm. But apparently that's not the case. Uh, so, um, in the Prahlada Sri, of course, it comes to the point where, where Prahlada is the embodiment of, of selflessness with regard to material life. He has no material selfishness, but he's only the beginning of spiritual selflessness, which reaches its zenith in Brajabhakti, where there's, there's no, they, they don't have any idea of their self whatsoever. Their self is their self, which will be what, what pleases you, is only what pleases Krishna. They have no other consideration there. The example of Rukmini compared to the gopis is um, worth citing in this regard. She had some spiritual selfishness or a sense of self and, and, and couldn't just run off with Krishna. It had to be authorized by the Vedas. So she sent a letter through the Brahman for, for a um, Gandharva marriage that she had been kidnapped. The gopis, they didn't have any consideration. Like they heard the flute, they went, that's all. Mm -hmm. Krishna, Krishna calling, we're going. But what about this? But what about that? There's no thought like that. So there's a gradation in, in this. We find also in Brief Bhagavatam a spiritual self lessness, forgetfulness of the self, if you will, which is, which is, as it increases, the identification with Krishna is, is increased. So this is kind of the oneness with Krishna in the oneness and difference equation, if you will. So, um, yeah, and, uh, you know, I've lectured on the Prahlad Charita. We have had festivals for three, four days at a time, lecturing morning and evening about uh, uh, the Shringalila many years, and uh, it's, it's, it's a wealth to be found there, uh, an insight, deep and important uh, spiritual insight. So, the lower, in the one sense, there's no lower topics, in another sense, there are, there are lower topics and higher topics, and, and the, the trick is to speak about the lower topics in, in the highest way, and, um, and, and then you can digest the higher topics. <laughs> Uh, as well. So, um, so um, at any rate, I was making the point that the, the questions of the students' interest in the philosophy, you know, it says, you know, he, he's reading the books, he's paying attention, he's thinking about these things, he's interested in this. Uh, I, I, I like to spend more time with him. We have something in common, you understand? Something like, we have something in common. Um, so, now that said, again, it's a sliding scale, so, um, I'm, you know, I've, I've been there and done that with regard to uh, um, having material difficulties and, uh, and, um, and I have my material experience. So I can be empathetic to the audience who are not that interested in the philosophy there, but they like me, and they, they like Krishna a little, but other things are more prominent in their lives because of where they're at. Um, so uh, we don't have as much to talk about, but um, so it's hard to be closer at that point, but at the same time, um, I identify with, with their situation and I, I can be, feel very happy finding ways in which the, 
they are comfortable with Krishna consciousness and applying themselves in that situation. If they have honestly, they don't have that much interest, or they were previously, for example, so on and so I used to think, beat myself up because I didn't have as much as enough interest. That doesn't make me happy. That doesn't. That, that makes me think, oh God, I've got to somehow I've got to save her from that. <laughs> don't do that. Find the level of your. You're attached to me, and, and the Vaishnav, that's your hope in life. So hang on to that and and apply yourself to the, according to the level of your understanding and enthusiasm. And we, find a way that we can uh, emphasize those things and then I feel a good student. <laughs> He's a good student, He's a good student. Something like that. So again, this is a sliding scale, but admittedly, when I'm asked questions about things that I'm preoccupied with, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, stimulating, but, um, but you know, that may take time and we got time. We're going to be around forever, so we better get used to one another. <laughs> uh, it's a bit of a rambling answer, maybe not entirely definitive, but those are some thoughts. I did better on this time. <laughs> Keep asking. The answer might get better. So, what else? Yes? I have a question <coughs> about Brahma. Because he was chanting Tapa and eventually uh, Krishna as Gopal appeared to him. He gave him uh, Gopal Mantra. But then uh, also we were reading and we are discussing recently that... He wasn't chanting Tapa. He heard the chanting Tapa. He heard the chanting Tapa. Once. Okay. And then he engaged in Tapa. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then Krishna appeared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say Tapa Tapa. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. But uh, the question is... Uh, we hear that when Bhakti is independent, but we get it from devotees. It seems like he got it directly from Krishna. So I was wondering, is it some special story with Brahma from past uh, life, or there is some way where Krishna directly uh, answers the call of a devotee? Well, it was a unique situation. There was nobody else around. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but also, it's, uh, it's mentioned in Bhaktivar Samhita Sindhu that one becomes a devotee uh, or attains Baba, for example, by either by um, Asana or by mercy. Mercy can come in two ways, by the mercy of a devotee or by the mercy of Krishna. So, there is an instance of by the mercy of Krishna, he, um, he, he became Krishna conscious. But again, uh, it was, he's the, he's the, he's the, uh, kind of the mytho-historical founder of the Brahma Sampradaya. So he has a uh, direct connection with Krishna. He's, he's not uh, a uh, typical kind of example uh, that those type of teachings are um, pertaining to. When you read, I think Mark was commenting on, uh, on literary economy, which may have brought this to your mind that we get bhakti from devotees. Is when the book is written for us, you know, our sisters, not written for Brahmas. Um, so, and that said, of course, it's not like when someone's born Brahma didn't have previous lives. Right? So to become a Brahman, you have to have some, done something. So, you know, not every Brahman is a devotee. Mm -hmm. The particular Brahman who is showcased in the Bhagavatam is, 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 is a nice devotee. But what was he before a Brahman? So, he could have met devotees then and got some Bhakti Sakriti and some Bhakti. Some scar and so forth, and now it's a Brahman. Is that help? Yeah. I would add, because I read recently that Vishwanatha Chakravarti Thakur was saying that, uh, uh, that Krishna 
Yeah, God is supposed to be impartial because he's a God of justice. Therefore, he's giving the mercy to the devotees. But it brought to my mind that actually Krishna is also independent and sometimes he can just break that rule. And I was wondering actually about Brahma, if that's the situation. Uh, he's yeah. not tied by the rule that he has to be. No, I mean, Krishna, 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 Krishna,
predictable, dynamic, exciting. Um, karma is 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 much of you know a breakdown of love where it becomes now. There's a law. The interactions are lawful. So there's justice, hmm? and Krishna defers to justice. So he doesn't typically interfere with that. Hmm? Um, and as you say, his devotees are the manifestation of his compassion and mercy, and they're moving in the world as another force. So there's the force of karma, and there's the force of bhakti. And through the force of bhakti, then the karma, karmic force can be overridden, and mercy can then take precedence over justice. Even though this was the just thing to do, mercy has played itself out, and uh, we were off the hook. To speak. That's the general idea, and so, and so Krishna then is 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 not involved, um, and therefore he's thought to be unbiased. Mm -hmm. um, of course, he does have a bias towards his devotees, but that's not a blemish; that's an ornament. If he was biased in this world and helped one person and not, not, not another, then he wouldn't be fair um, and um, he, would, he would be faulted. So he's just kind of like not involved. And the fruits of what we, the fruits that we experience in life are based on what we sow. He's not, he's not involved in that. Um, his devotees, his mercy, then that's another thing there. Spreading good, good fortune and uh, and um, creating that for, for others, overriding the system of justice. Um, and um, then your question is: Well, doesn't Krishna sometimes override the justice? Um, he does, but the way in which Krishna does it is in relation to his devotees. So that is a different realm. Krishna doesn't interfere in a material situation, and he has no experience of material suffering, as you know. Um, so he's not the best person to be empathetic for material suffering. If Krishna had experience of material suffering, maybe he could be more empathetic for your suffering. But if he had experience of material suffering, he couldn't save it from it, because material suffering comes from material attachment and ignorance, and he would have been in ignorance. And he's not in ignorance, and that's why he can save us. So you can't say, you know, I wish he felt more empathetic for my material situation. He sounds a little aloof, but if he's not aloof and he's involved in it, then he's not a fit person to deliver us from it. So, so you have this in between the way it's resolved in Gaudi Vaishnavism, theologically, but there are the devotees, they're the extension of Krishna himself. And uh, they over, they have empathy. They've had, they've been there. They've done that. They've had material experience, so they can be empathetic. Hmm? And um, and and bhakti is the very compassionate nature of Krishna. So as bhakti grows within one, he, he or she can't tolerate the suffering of others on any level. Hmm? Jive doi Krishna nam sarvadaya sar. We heard. Mm, he had a 10-acre kitchen for feeding people of Bengal during the uh, you know, during the drought and, uh, and so forth. And he's giving Krishna bhakti also. So um, their magnanimous ocean sort of, 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 of mercy and so forth. Um, that's their nature. Krishna is also compassionate. That's one of his qualities. But his compassion and his mercy is expressed in relation to his devotees, who he's interacting with, because they are, he is completely under the influence of and overwhelmed by his Sarup Shakti. That's Krishna. Hmm? Krishna means God overwhelmed by his Sarup Shakti. That's what makes him the son of Yasoda. 
that it makes him the friend of uh, Subal and Sudama. And, and the, 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 the lover of Radha, which means he's by, under their control. He can't, I mean, he's God, but he has to, he has to do what they want by the power of the force of love. Without, the, the less there is bhakti in the equation of our relationship with Bhagavan, then the less Bhagavan is controlled. So as we move from Braj to Vaikuntha, Bhagavan, the same Bhagavan, appears more as the controller. In, in Vaikuntha, he's the controller. Lakshmi doesn't have a relationship with Narayan like Radha does with Krishna, right? So bhakti, the more bhakti is a factor, the more uh, uh, Krishna is um, not ostensibly appearing as a controller. Now he's appearing as a son, as a, as a, as a friend, as uh, a, a depressed lover. <laughs> who can't get the attention of his, of his beloved. Huh? This is, doesn't look at all like the typical picture of God, right? The controller and so forth. Ishwa, Narayana, shelter of all beings. But he is, but so Bhakti is really, this is a beta beta equation between Bhakti and Krishna. And Bhakti, you can't have Krishna without that particular kind of bhakti, that rag bhakti, that is Krishna. And that rag bhakti has an object and that it corresponds with, so they're one and different at the same time. So, this Krishna, Krishna is under the control of bhakti, so he can't move outside of the orbit of bhakti, even if he wanted to, he can't. Now, of course, you have to understand that bhakti, that subshakti, is his own nature. So again, it's one with him. We have, we have three principal shaktis of Bhagavan. Do you understand me? We have three, three principal shaktis of Krishna. Do you understand my English? What are the three? Three shaktis of Krishna. Maya Shakti, Tatasta Shakti, and Swarup Shakti, right? So, all these Shaktis are one with Krishna and different from Krishna at the same time. But Maya Shakti is more different than it is one. The Swarup Shakti is more one than it is different. We, 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 we can be more one, or we could be more different, depending on which of the two other two we come under the influence of. Hmm? So we are very much a product of our environment. We have a nature that lends itself to being nurtured in a particular way that determines our potential and the nature of our existence. So that anyway, the Sarup Shakti. Krishna being under the control of his Sarup Shakti doesn't compromise his being the Supreme God because it's his own internal Shakti. Again, we move between this obeyed perspective to the Bade perspective. At any rate, he is under the control of Bhakti. Bhakti is not under the control of Krishna. <laughs> She's more independent than Krishna. Wherever bhakti goes, Krishna has to go. If bhakti comes to you, Krishna has to go there. He cannot avoid it. Hmm? So, this is the orbit in which he stays. Right? So, he can only show mercy then in that uh, context and compassion, which is one of his qualities for his devotees. And this is who he's interacting with. And that's good for those who aren't devotees because there's a person who's beyond the condition that the non-devotees are in, which is a condition of ignorance and suffering. 
he has no experience of that. Hmm? So that answer your question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, you know, we might find instances where Krishna seems to show mercy to somebody who's not a devotee in the context of his Lila, perhaps. Or we'd say he slays demons and there's some mercy in it. But then, this is Leela and how they even got there. There's some background to that. Uh, like if you, you know, like you like, like Argus and Lita, for example, who was Putin in the previous life, who was Trinavarta in the previous life, and so we get some interesting stories there. So, and Krishna's in his Leela. There's another way to look at that too. Krishna's Leela, of course, is his own world, even if he manifests it here. But here, it's a possibility of some people coming into it who aren't supposed to be there. Hmm? And so if, you, if they come in, I guess you can deal with them in that situation. <laughs> They're in there. And how do they get in? Jiva Goswami says that, that sometimes, because there are some stories like Durvas uh, offended Ambarish, and then the chakra started chasing him. So he went to Brahma and said, oh, I can't help you. From, you know, go to Shiva. Shiva, Shiva said, oh, I can't help you. Go to Narayan. So he went to Narayan and he entered into Vaikuntha. And Narayan said, I can't help you. You have to go back to Ambarish. He offended my devotee. You, know, you have to go back to him. But then someone says, well, how did Durvas get into Vaikuntha? <laughs> Jiva Goswami says, sometimes a king brings a tiger within a cage into the assembly hall for his royal assembly to look at and be amused by. Hmm? So sometimes Narayan lets some uncivilized non-devotee into Vaikuntha that the inhabitants can be amused by. <laughs> What a strange creature. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> so, Krishna stays within the orbit of the Sarupsha. And in the context of the orbit that he moves within, he's merciful, he's compassionate. Okay. What's the time? 20 past 7. Okay, so. What's next, Arctic? And then Prashat, right? Typically. Are you going to have a native ceremony tonight, like last night? Well, I thought, what if they do? They've got a drum set now. All I could hear was the drums, and then I thought, oh, they're chanting too. Okay. I thought the natives were getting restless. Tonight would be a better night for a fire, though it's a little cooler, huh? Mm -hmm. Yes, pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in Gopala Champu, uh, oh. Jiva Goswami starts Gopala Champu with a very long description of Go Goloka based on the first verses of, of Brahma Samhita, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, triangles and tridents and lotus petals and and it's very complicated, at least the translation I was reading didn't seem to figure it all out. Yeah. But, but I'm wondering about the purpose of this description. Because it seems nobody else, after Jeeva Goswami, picks up on this. And it's very much Aishwarya and, and kind of a, a abstract. Um, yeah, well I'll say that I, I, the, the translations and uh, commentaries even of Brahma Samhita, Jiva Goswami's commentary there, or uh, the beginning of Gopal Champu. It's, it's, I think the translations of Brahma Samhita, his commentary, are accurate um, in that sense, but still it's uh, abstract, the concept. In Gopal Champu, I think it's a Champu, it's much more difficult to translate. These really long sentences, in English and so forth, and so persons have tried to, a couple persons uh, have tried to translate it, and, and when you have 
in that genre an effort to explain something that's already abstract. Uh, I also found it like a little tedious and, and, and when I remember first reading it, difficult to kind of like get a handle on, so to speak. Um, but um, you know, these are like basically, um, what, what's the word for that? Um, you know, um, in the tantra, it's like a picture of a, like a, a yantra, yantra. So it's, it's sign language, you know, it's, it's symbolic. Uh, um, um, uh, and a, a type of visualization that um, corresponds with the mantra, for example, and, and, the, and the person describes. So you have the person, for example, Krishna, or the abode of Krishna, which is a, a sacred geography, and, and then you have the symbolic map present, uh, presentation of it that's, in one sense, seeks to make it more concrete and something that you can meditate on and so forth, but in other senses is, uh, is, as you say, is very abstract, and we don't, you're right, we don't find it played out anywhere else in the Gaudi literature. It's more like yogic. Yoga is really full of symbolism, subtleties, and, uh, um, uh, you know, the chakras, and uh, <laughs> this kind of subtle world type of stuff. Yantras uh, are, you know, prominent in that, that realm. It doesn't seem to be um, have anywhere near the same kind of prominence in Gaudiya Vaishnavism. But, you know, it does show up here and there. Um, so, um, I agree with you that it was like as to uh, uh, why he even starts like that, for example, in Gopal Champu, maybe because the Mahaprabhu thought or uh, taught that the fifth chapter of the Brahma Samhita is a you know authoritative description, so he's going to write a Champu about Krishna Leela in Golok and how they're reflecting on the on the Bhama Leela, which Gopal Champu is about. So he wants to describe the place and and this is a reference that Mahaprabhu accepted and validated, and so he's drawing from it there. I mean, his, he, the explanation in Gopal Champu is, is in one sense, it's got the Champu problem, you know, the genre of the, of the, the text, but it's, uh, it, it's a little more concrete or, uh, I think, understandable than Brahma Samhita's uh, explanation. So, I would just say these are, you know, was, is one way in which it was described, and for a different uh, mindset, and you come to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's, I mean, I mean, Golok is very abstract and very secret. It's the Mahabhaikuntha, and it's co covered in this way. And indeed, the way the map or the sacred geography is talked about, we've got tridents on different corners, and keeping people out. And it's a way of saying well, all these, all the cities are there, and they're all present there and so forth, that they represented on the circumference and protecting the place. And it's kind of a way of saying everything that's possible in every other path is, is there in the local. At least that's one aspect of, of what it's saying. Um, and given that Brahma Samhita, we take it as some very old text, long, long before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Gaudiya Vaishnavism, then the ways in which such a thing would be talked about would be more secretive. I mean, Brahma Samhita ends with verses like, um, what is it? Um, um, yeah, how's it end? Shriya Kanta Kanta Parma Purusha Prabhupada Bhumabhumi Shintamani Ganamai Toya Mamritam Kataka 
Anunatyam Gamramati Bhamsi Priyasati Chiramati. And then the next one. Aham Vajra Shweta Dipam, Aham Vajra Shweta Dipam Tamaham Gulogam Itiyam. So here Gulog is referred to as Shweta Dweep and as a place that's very known to a very, very few people. Very, very secret place. Now it's been talked about in this, this abstract, described language, at least so far as it's kind of sacred geography of it, and that corresponds with this, this very um, uh, impenetrable, difficult place to get to. Um, um, and then comes Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, like opening the doors to it everywhere, and so on. So you, you can bring that description along, put it there, and then, you know, you said it, now but the doors are open, let's talk about it more, what it's all about, the bhavas of it, and, 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 and personify them through the new narratives and so forth, and, and talk about the, the essence of it, what makes it go round, and so on and so forth, rather than, you know, some geographical type of, trans-geographical, trans-spatial kind of explanation of it, which, um, is a lesser explanation in one sense. Some thoughts. Is that help? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Guru Maharaj, we would like to invite you to join us for a celebration of Bhakti Yoda Ash and uh, Swami's birthday uh, just now. And so we invite all the devotees to. Is there any cake? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bhakti Bhai Ashram Maharaj. Jai. 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 Jai.